What if we could look back in time to witness the universe's very first moments? What secrets would the oldest light in the cosmos reveal about the origin of the universe? Brian Cox delves into these questions by exploring the cosmic microwave background radiation, a relic of the universe's infancy. This relic of the cosmos is not just any light, it is the oldest light in the universe. So we can look up into the sky and we can see the oldest light in the universe. It was released 380,000 years after the Big Bang, when the universe cooled down sufficiently for atoms to form. And at that point, the universe became transparent and that light has been traveling through the universe ever since. And we have a satellite up at the moment called Planck. It's a European satellite that's been taking detailed pictures of this light. And in that light, it's like a baby picture of the universe, like a scan, a baby scan of the universe in a sense. And so you can look to the universe as it was in its very earliest days and see different structures and different properties of that light. And they give you the clue as to what happened right back at the beginning of time, the beginning of the universe. Planck was Europe's first mission to study the cosmic microwave background. It measured the temperature variations with much better sensitivity, angular resolution and frequency range than any previous satellite giving astronomers an unprecedented view of our universe. As the nascent universe underwent expansion, it also experienced a decrease in temperature. During a period known as recombination, the universe had cooled enough for electrons and nuclei to combine and form atoms. Concurrently, light that was previously trapped within the plasma was liberated, allowing it to traverse space freely. This transition was akin to the universe shifting from an opaque state to a transparent one. The problem with light is that in those earliest times, the universe was so hot and so dense that light couldn't travel through it. So it was opaque. So you can't use light to go back earlier than that. But what we can potentially do, not yet, we're not good enough yet, but the technology we use now to detect colliding black holes, we have the technology to do that. And that technology possibly could allow us to probe right back to this thing, the Big Bang. The Planck Observatory, in conjunction with the Hubble Space Telescope, has greatly enhanced our comprehension of the universe's nascent stages, revealing cosmic secrets through their observations of distant stars and galaxies. The torch of cosmic exploration is now being passed to the James Webb Space Telescope. As we peer deeper into the cosmos with this new technology, we're also looking back in time, Observing light from a galaxy two million light years away is like witnessing events that occurred two million years ago, offering us a unique window into the past. The web is a significant step forward. And technically, one of the most important things is it can see what we call longer wavelength light, or infrared light. And that's important because if you think about, we want to see the first galaxies forming. So we want to understand how the first stars and galaxies formed in the universe. And so what you do is you look far out into the universe. And because light travels quite slowly across cosmic distances, let's say you have a galaxy that's the most distant one you can see with the naked eye is about two million light years away. So that means that the light has been traveling for two million years to reach us. It's a remarkable thing, actually, to think when you look, it's called the Andromeda Galaxy. And if you know where you're looking, you can just catch it out of the corner of your eye. If you think about it, you're seeing that as it was two million years ago. I mean, it began its journey before we had evolved on Earth. And that's the nearest neighboring galaxy. The web looks so far out that it's capturing light that's been traveling for over 13 billion years. But the universe has been expanding. And so the light has been stretching. And so for the most distant galaxies, we're looking back, back in time almost to the Big Bang. The Hubble was not sensitive to that light. So the web can see the formation of the first galaxies is essentially looking all the way back to very close to the beginning of time. And that's very important because we're not entirely sure exactly how those first galaxies formed. Light, the fastest traveler in the cosmos, acts as a messenger from the distant past, bringing us images from the far reaches of space. So we can look to light that began its journey before there were galaxies. And that's the, the oldest light in the universe, which is, by the way, one of the pieces of evidence when people say, I don't believe in the Big Bang. The answer is, well, you can see it. We have pictures of it. That light, it turns out that there are sort of structures or ripples in that 
light, which we can use as a ruler. And then because that light's been traveling through the universe, we can see how that ruler has been distorted as the light has traveled through space. And so we can infer whether space is flat or curved or how it's warped just from that measurement. This brings us to a crucial point in understanding the universe. The speed of light is not just a constant, it's a cornerstone of modern physics, deeply embedded in the fabric of space and time. Cox delves into the intricacies of this concept, rooted in Einstein's theory of relativity, which revolutionized our understanding of how the universe operates. We could go a bit deeper. Einstein's theory of relativity is a theory of space-time, so we often refer to as the fabric of the universe. And it has a, a structure, it has a geometry. And built into the theory is the idea that there is a speed which is always seen to be the same for any observer, which is a really weird thing. This was the clue, actually, to Einstein that relativity was necessary. It was a, a strong suggestion from the laws of electricity and magnetism back in the 1860s that light travelled at a constant speed for all observers. When you build that, when you build a theory around that idea, it turns out that this speed becomes a, a limiting speed that you can't travel beyond. And it turns out that the speed is the speed that all things with no mass have to travel at, and all things with mass have to travel slower than. You can't travel at the speed of light if you have mass. And also, it turns out, interestingly, that if you draw a line, so let's draw a line over space-time, which is the path of a beam of light. And for something going along that path, if you had a watch and you looked at it, no time would tick. So that there's no time for a photon, from its point of view, traveling through the universe, traveling over space-time at the speed of light. So all those things are really interesting, and they're part of, ultimately, the geometry of space-time and built into the theory and the theory is consistent and works and does make predictions that we've tested i mean equals mc squared for example which is the foundation of our understanding of the stars but also nuclear reactors and so on brian cox's insights into the behavior of light and the fabric of space-time highlight the extraordinary ways we perceive and understand the universe however light even with its incredible speed and informative nature doesn't tell us the whole story there are phenomena in the universe that remain invisible to us, eluding our current observational capabilities. One of the most intriguing of these is dark matter. Despite its invisibility to telescopes, dark matter's presence and effects are inferred from gravitational influences on visible matter, radiation, and the large-scale structure of the universe. It does not emit, absorb, or reflect light, making it truly dark and undetectable by conventional means. So we look out into the universe and we see that there's a lot of stuff there that's interacting gravitationally, but is not interacting strongly with the matter out of which we are made and the stars are made. So a thing called dark matter, it's almost certain that that's some form of particle that fits beautifully. And we see lots of different observations, the way galaxies rotate and interact and even that oldest light in the universe, the so-called cosmic microwave background radiation, we see the signature of that stuff in that light as well. So we think that there's some other particle out there. And, and to be honest, we thought we would have detected it, I think, at LHC. We have lots of theories called supersymmetric theories that make predictions for all sorts of different particles that would interact weakly with normal matter. And yeah, I think it's broadly seen as a surprise that we haven't seen them at LHC. So that just may well mean that either they're a bit too massive, so we need more energy to make them, and we just haven't quite got enough. Or we're not making enough of them often enough to see them, which is one of the reasons we're upgrading the LHC. So we also look for them, by the way, directly. So we have experiments under mountains, bury them under mountains so the cosmic rays from space don't interfere with them. And we're looking for the rare occasions when these dark matter particles bump into the particles of matter in the detector. The galaxy is swimming with dark matter, as far as we can tell, but it interacts very weakly with this matter, so it doesn't bump into us very often. So we're looking for the direct detection of it, and we're looking to make those particles at LHC.